Hello and welcome to the sixth and last lecture of the discrete mathematics course. And uh, well, today there will be two main say topics. The first one will be with these slides, and the second one will be just with the whiteboard. The first one is uh, going beyond NP completeness, and the second will be the overview of the course and some technical details. So uh, beyond NP completeness, uh, what does it mean? Well, before going uh, forward, let us uh, recall what the NP class means. So um, we use what we call definition two with hints. Uh, this definition is actually more convenient, uh, but uh, it does not fully reflect the idea of being non-deterministic, which is the N letter in NP and P is for polynomial. So the definition is as follows. So we have a decision problem A of X. So recall that a decision problem means that the input is some finite object, well, which can be encoded by a word of bits of zeros and one. And uh, the result is just one bit. So it's either zero or one. And we say that the answer to the problem is yes. If uh, there exists such a Y, which we call a hint or a witness, uh, such that it's of polynomial size, so Q here is a polynomial of the size of the input, so the size of the hint should be relatively small. Uh, and uh, then we compute some polynomially decidable predicate. So uh, given X and Y, we compute uh, something and if the answer is yes then we, we say that a of x is yes so here is the existential quantifier exists y which corresponds to what we call angelic choice so this means that we are given a hint and the person or the force which gives us the hint wishes us good luck it wishes us to win it wishes us to answer yes so if such a hint exists then the answer to the problem is yes. If it doesn't exist, then we have no, no way to solve it, and we answer no. So if we replace this quantifier with the for all quantifier, it's what's called demonic choice. So the person who gives us the hint actually plays against us. And if there is at least one Y for which we could answer no, then this Y would be given. So this is a dual class, which is called co-NP. And it's formed by the complements of the languages or sets which belong to P. So this is the definition with hints. Uh, this can be implemented in polynomial time on a non-deterministic machine because we just guess this hint, the bits of the hint. Also, this each problem from the NP class is decidable because if we have, but not maybe not in polynomial time, because if we have say unlimited time or well, finite but unlimited uh, then we can just try all possible hints one by one and this will give us an exponential exponential time algorithm now let us check uh yeah so for convenience we could check this condition inside r so we could actually make this hint more than polynomial but too long hints will be just uh, d d dismissed by the algorithm R. So standard examples um, of uh, such hints. So our say typical problem for NP class was the satisfiability problem, which we called SAT. So satisfiability problem is uh, the problem of um, whether a given Boolean formula, which can be arbitrary, could be given in a CNF, for example, has a satisfying assignment. We see that this satisfying assignment is exactly a hint for NP because uh, if we are given the satisfying assignment, then checking that it is really a satisfying assignment is very easy done in polynomial time. And if uh, we are not given, then we are in NP. We have to guess it. Hamiltonian cycles, when you know about them, also. For example, Euler cycle is also an example of such a witness, right? It belongs to uh, NP, but we know that Euler cycle is actually. Polynomial is decidable. The same happens for, say, 2 CNF satisfiability. Again, we have the, we trivially know that it is in NP, but a more clever approach says that actually it is polynomial 
we can do resolution input and all that. Uh, so uh, beyond decision problems, so we are now uh, what I'm going to do the following. We take an NP problem, the problem which belongs to NP class in the definition with the witness or with the hint. So we say that the decision problem for an NP problem is that uh, there is a question whether there exists such a witness. If there exists, we answer yes. If no, the answer no. Uh, we could also ask for all witnesses. And the algorithm can yield them with polynomial delay. We discussed this last time. Uh, there is also a search problem, which is a easier version of the previous one, which says we can yield just one witness or say no if there is none. And the interesting variation is the counting problem, uh, where we are asked to yield the number of witnesses. So, for example, the number of satisfying assignments for a Boolean formula or the number of, say, Hamiltonian cycles in a graph or something like that, or the number of correct colorings of a graph. And uh, so each NP problem uh, has a corresponding counting problem. So the NP problem asks whether there exists a witness, exists such Y. The counting problem asks for the number of them. And uh, the corresponding complexity class is called sharp P. Sharp is for numbering form, enumeration. So, uh, Easily, the counting problem is always at least as hard as the corresponding NP problem. Because uh, if you have uh, a solution for a counting problem, uh, you just compare the result with zero and get the solution for the decision problem. So sharp P is a class which is in a sense harder, but it's not a formal notion because it's just a different class. The type of answer is different. So if for NP, the type of answer is um, Yes or no, so just boolean. For counting problems, the answer is integer. It's natural number. Yeah, this is written here. So a priori, the decision problem is the easiest one from all of them. So suppose that we can solve the search problem or the counting problem or something that's polynomial delay. Then we automatically get the solution for the decision problem for the same predicate R. Search problems are also not harder than decision ones. We also discussed it earlier. So if P equals NP, this means that any decision problem for the NP class can be solved in polynomial time, then also any search problem is solvable in polynomial time. Uh, we did it by uh, dichotomy. So for example, if we take SAT and we ask not just for decidability, for decision problem, which means that we ask whether there exists a satisfying assignment, um, the same, uh, we, we can also solve the searching problem, find one of the satisfying assignments, and we did it, it can be done by dichotomy using the decision algorithm for SAT. Uh, we can do, say, resolution or something like that. If P equals NP, such an algorithm could become polynomial. Of course, we apply it for different instances of SAT, but nevertheless, we can do it. And since any other NP problem is reducible to SAT, and this reduction also Say formally speaking, the reduction is for the decision problem, but actually our reductions they were as follows in Cook Levin. We having a witness for the corresponding satisfying things, we could re restore the witness for the original problem. So it also works for such problems. Um, yeah, it's not always for the same decision problem as, as I mentioned. So. Uh, and here is a, some sort of example. So suppose we have this uh, R of phi Y, which means that Y is a pair such that A is satisfying assignment for phi and B is satisfying assignment for not phi. Um, or, yeah, or. So uh, this is an example of a decision problem where the decision problem is easy, but the search problem is much harder. So uh, it's a bit of contradictory with the uh, with this thing, but the difference is that here we said that if p equals n p, then any search problem is solvable in polynomial time. But this means that if all decision problems are, are solvable in polynomial time, then all uh, search problems are solvable in polynomial time. Uh, but if you Ask about a concrete problem, it could be they could they could make a difference. So this is an artificial example. Let's look at that. So you see like that. Y is a pair of A and B, 
and we ask uh, for the following. We either want A to satisfy phi or B to satisfy not phi. So what about the decision problem here? For a given formula phi, does there exist such a pair of A and B such that either A satisfies phi or B satisfies not phi? Well, for the decision problem, the answer is trivially yes, right? Because uh, either phi or not phi is satisfiable, of course. And therefore, we can, if there is a, a satisfying assignment for phi, we put it as A. If it is not phi, we put it as B. And uh, so if we are asked just about existence of such pair, we can always answer yes. The trivial algorithm always answers yes. But the search problem here is equivalent to the one for set. Because if we really want to obtain such an assignment, we need actually to, to, to run satisfiability for phi, and uh, there is no other way of doing that. Because we have to really find out such an assignment. Actually, I think this is a bit of a mistake, and we should not put this A or B, because otherwise we could just put the same A here. And it will be either satisfying assignment for phi or not phi. I just noticed this error. Actually, the real thing we should do here is not just putting A or B, but just here we should put one bit choosing phi or not phi. And here we should put the satisfying assignment. So it's a different. I will fix this on the slides when I publish them uh, because, uh, yeah, this will be the correct one. So again, it should be not a pair of A and B, but a pair of, say, 0 and A or 1 and B. Oh, no, no, 0 and B or 1 and A. So 0 means we choose not phi and we try to satisfy it. And 1 says we choose phi and try to satisfy it. Okay, so uh, such an assignment always exists because either phi or not phi is satisfiable. But when we need to, to actually to give it, to, to yield it, we should find out which one we, we, we should satisfy. And for that, we have to solve the satisfiability problem. Because when we yield the result, we yield the answer for the one and six. Sorry, so I will fix that. So this says that search is, uh, so in, in, in general, the, so the class of all search problems based on NP problems uh, is, has basically the same complexity as NP. But for concrete problems, the, there could be a difference. And the other example is counting problems. So sharp P is the class of counting problems which correspond to NP decision problems. And counting problems can also be harder than the corresponding decision ones. And we'll see example now. So there is a theorem. We'll not prove this theorem. We will prove a simpler one. But just for you to, to know that this is, this is true, we, I, I formulated it here because um, we shall use it in our today's practical class. We can use it without proof. And this uh, states the following. So recall two set. So two set is satisfiability for two CNFs, right? And two set as a decision problem belongs to P, right? So if given a two CNF, we ask whether it is decidable. And this is a polynomially solvable thing. Uh, also, the search problem belongs to P. We know this is was your homework number one. Uh, also, you can yield you all the satisfying assignments with polynomial delay. Everything is fine. But the counting problem for two set is not solvable in polynomial time unless P equals NP. So it's something like being NP hard, NP complete. But uh, you cannot say that sharp two set is NP complete because it's not a decision problem. So NP completeness is a notion only for decision problems, for problems with answer yes or no. Here, the, the result should be a natural number, and we cannot say that it's NP complete, but there are still some sort of reductions which uh, say that if this count to SAT is solvable in polynomial time, then so will be the decision problem for SAT, for three SAT, for example, and by Kukul Evin, it will be NP hard. So, in order to prove theorems like this one, uh, one has to develop the theory of sharp P completeness. So, this sharp to SAT. Is going to, it's not going to be NP complete, it's going to be complete or hard in this sharp P class. And this is done by what is called counting reductions, 
So in the theory of NP completeness, we use as the basis of this theory polynomial M reductions. So recall that A is polynomially M reducible to B. If there is a computable, com polynomially computable function F, such that if we take X and then we take F of X, then f of x belongs to b, so b from f of x is 1, if and only if x belongs to a. So this is the exactly the reduction, because how to solve a knowing how to solve b? Well, we take x, we apply this function f, and thus reduce it to b. And afterwards to that we apply b, and if it yields 1, then a is 1, and if it yields 0, then a is 0. In the theory of sharp p completeness, we use counting reduction. And the counter reduction consists of two functions, f on input data and g on results. So this is how it works. So recall that a and b are counting sharp a and sharp b are counting problems. So this means that sharp, say sharp a of x is the number of y witnesses such that r of x y equals 1. It's a natural number. So 0 is also considered as a natural number in this course. Same for B, but it will be not R, but some S. And we say that uh, sharp A reduces in a countable way to sharp B. If there exists a pair of computably, polynomial computable reducing functions F and G, such that if we have an input X, what we do? We want to solve sharp A. We uh, solve sharp B for some image of X, so we reduce it to sharp B. And sharp B gives us some results, some count. But then we can also compute something from this count. So this is a, a crucial difference from uh, reductions in the NP class. In the NP class, the reduction said the following. We have, we have our input. We reduce our problem to B. And then that very result that B gives us is going to be our answer. But there it was logical because uh, B uh, was a decision problem. So it could return only 0 or 1. And we didn't want to, to, to flip it, so we, we just returned it. But here, sharp b returns some number, and we have the right to take this number and uh, also apply some polynomial, com polynomial computable algorithm to it and recount it. So the reduction could be, for example, that we take, uh, we take the result and we say divided by 2, because when we reduce, then the number of witnesses is multiplied by 2. And this indeed allows to reduce sharp A to sharp B in the same way as in the NP class. So suppose we know how to solve sharp B, so know how to count witnesses for problem B. If we want to solve sharp A, then we take the X, apply F, and solve sharp B that yields us a natural number, and then we apply function G. So one more thing which I didn't put on the slides, but which is an important thing. Uh, Notice here that uh, when, we when we talk about polynomial computations on natural numbers, they should be represented, say, in binary form, not in unary one. Uh, so this means that uh, the algorithm should be polynomial with respect to the logarithm of the number, not the number itself. Because otherwise we could do something strange, like uh, do brute force up to this number or something like that. For example, if we take uh, uh, if we take uh, the number of uh, satisfying assignments, it could be exponential itself. But its binary notation is polynomial because it's a logarithm. So uh, a counting problem is called sharp p complete. If for any other problem we have a reduction, this is the same as NP completeness. And we can uh, develop a theory of sharp p-complete problems, which is in a sort of parallel to the theory of NP-completeness. So for NP-completeness, NP NP-hardness, we had the um, theory that problems reduce to each other and stuff like that. And uh, here we are talking about counting problems and the corresponding sharp p-complete problems. For those who came later, I will recall that uh, we are talking about sharp p problems. So if we have an NP problem, which says that we have to find that whether there exists a y such that r of x, y gives 1. For counting problems, we have to count the number of such y's. Now we have the reductions. 
on counting problems, which say the following. So uh, we compute some, uh, we want to reduce A to B. We take the input for A, we compute some polynomial computable function F, then we apply the counting problem for B and get some count for B, and then we also may apply some function G, which somehow modifies the count. This was the difference from the NP class where we just returned that bit, which was for B. Um, a counter reduction where the second function is the identity is called a parsimonious reduction. So parsimonious, I don't know the translation to Russian, unfortunately. Um, the parsimonious reduction is like um, uh, M reduction. So we don't modify the counter after we have to yield the answer. And also any parsimonious reduction is also a specific kind of M reduction. Because in particular G of zero is zero and G of non-zero is non-zero. And therefore, if we have a parsimonious reduction of counting problems, it induces a, an M reduction on the corresponding decision problems, right? And thus it conveys the answer to the decision problem. Isn't it? Okay. So clear, right? So if we have this reduction, so which is a specific kind where we're not allowed to do anything with the answer, it's parsimonious reduction or one-to-one -one reduction. So the parsimonious reduction is a one-to-one -one reduction of witnesses. Uh, so uh, this is not always the case for our M reductions, because sometimes it could be the case that um, one satisfying assignment, say, yields several colorings of graphs or something like that. So this could be a problem. The reductions in cook levin theorem are parsimonious. So uh, each trajectory, so recall of the proof of cook levin we had an arbitrary NP problem, and we reduce it to set. How do we do this? Well, we are uh, each uh, trajectory of the, so uh, the NP problem is a problem of, we now use another definition, not with hints, but with non-deterministic Turing machines. Each trajectory of the non-deterministic run of the machine is represented by exactly one satisfying assignment for our formula in Cook level. So this is parsimonious, it's one to one. So it's a reduction of of, of uh, decision problems. Decision problem for A corresponds to the um, to satisfiability. And each hint or each non-deterministic run corresponds to exactly one uh, satisfying assignment. So the counting problems is reduced also in parsimonious way. You want to count the number of hints which are Correct witnesses, the same that to count the uh, satisfying assignments for this bullet point. And this yields the counting version of Cook Levin theorem, which says that the counting problem for SAT is also sharp P complete, as the uh, decision version of SAT is NP complete. So the same proof gives us the same result. So um, next. Uh, the sequence of configurations or protocol of A on input is encoded as a binary matrix, and then we construct it like that. This is just the recall of Cook Levin. And also, Satin's transformations are parsimonious. So, recall that what is a Satin transformation is that given a formula phi, you can construct a 3 CNF psi such that satisfying assignments for psi are one to one correspondence with those for phi. So they're equisatisfiable, they're not equivalent, so the, the same formula, but it's equisatisfiable. So given a satisfying assignment for phi, you yield exactly one satisfying assignment for this 3 CNF psi. So recall that uh, how it was uh, Satan transformation computed, something like that, right? So we had this formula, which was not a 3 CNF, we replaced it with this one. We introduced new variables, as I say, like in three address assembler code. But the satisfying assignments for these new variables are just one to, are just uniquely obtained from the assignment for the old variables, right? Because they're just equivalences here. And this means that this reduction is a parsimonious one. So the values for the new variables are restored in a unique way. And this means that the corresponding counting problems, sharp to reset, is also sharp to complete. So this is the bootstrap. We, uh, like in NP completeness, we managed to um, somehow 
uh, prove something NP hard and started from that. So from three side we proved NP hardness of other problems. Uh, again, here we uh, have this uh, three side sharp peak. So yeah, it's not a, a, it's a acquisition file, but not equivalent. Unfortunately, uh, we have to go beyond, or maybe fortunately, we have to go beyond parsimonious reductions. Because if we uh, use only parsimonious reductions for establishing sharp P completeness of some problems, then we don't have any gain. Because um, if a counting problem sharp A is proven to be sharp P complete by only parsimonious reductions, then it means that E, well, we recall that each parsimonious reduction uses an M reduction which means that the corresponding decision problem A is going to be NP complete. But in the case that if P is not equal to NP, which most people believe in, we know that even A is not polynomially solvable because it's NP complete. But then nothing to say about sharp A because sharp A is a counting problem and the counting problem is more complicated than the decision problem. So establishing sharp P completeness only using parsimonious reductions doesn't give us any new, say, hardness results. But more general counting reductions could give interesting results. And interesting cases include situations where the decision problem is polynomially decidable, where the counting problem is hard, well, meaning sharp P hard. A famous example is two set. So uh, we know that the to set as a decision problem belongs to P. And now we shall give a proof. Uh, well, we, no, we shall not give a proof of the sub P completeness, which is technically hard. So, but suppose we manage to prove that the counting version of to set is uh, sharp P complete. What would that mean? That means that uh, suppose P is not equal to NP. If the counting version of two set is sharp P complete. Then say the counting version of three set is reducible to counting version of two set, right? By a counting reduction. Then if we have a polynomial algorithm for solving sharp two set, we would have a polynomial algorithm for solving sharp three set. But having an algorithm for solving sharp three set yields an algorithm for solving three set as a decision problem. But if P is not equal to NP, then this could, be, could not be the case. And therefore, uh, if we, we know that sharp to side is sharp P complete, then it's not polynomial decidable unless P equals NP. And we have this gap. So for two set, the decision problem belongs to P. The third problem is polynomially decidable, but the counting problem is not, unless P equals NP. So uh, there are just references to some papers where one can find a proof. Uh, the, so by Bendor Halevi and uh, Valiant. Uh, so we will see something easier today, but you can just refer to these uh, references if you want to, to see the proof. There will be a series, as usual, there will be a series of reductions through the permanent problem. We'll talk about the permanent problem a bit now, but uh, not about the sharp, to, to chapter set. So we'll just like, uh, recall that, say, when we proved NP completeness for Hamiltonian path, there was some quite artificial gadgets, some quite artificial constructions of that. We consider an easy example, which is DNF set versus uh, counting version of DNF set. So uh, recall that DNF set is a uh, question whether to, well to find a satisfying assignment for a formula which is given in disjunctive normal form. And in opposite to the conjunctive one, it's easily solvable as a decision or search problem. We did it several times. So we take the DNF as a big disjunction. Satisfying the disjunction is the same as just satisfying one of its clauses. And we just go along the disjunction, try to satisfy at least one of them. And how to satisfy a clause? It's a conjunction, it's satisfiable, even though leaf is non contradictory. So it doesn't include P and not P simultaneously. So it's an easy decision problem. And also, search problem is actually follows from that because, well, we, we know with this concrete um, 
uh, clause of conjunction is uh, satisfiable, well, we'll just see the variables there and just put the corresponding values to the literals. And uh, for other, we we'll just make it arbitrary. So here the search problem is also trivial. We don't even need some sort of dichotomy or something like that. So search problem uh, and decision problem here are polynomial and solvable. But not the case for sharp B. So we have the duality. Let's uh, take the following. For a given formula phi, so now we're going to reduce, this should be sharp CNF set. So we know that the sharp CNF set is sharp B complete, right? By uh, Cook Levin and Satan. By parsimonious versions of Cook Levin and Satan. That means that if P is not equal to NP, that they could not be solvable in a polynomial time. Now, uh, we, let's reduce sharp CNF set to sharp DNF set. Take the, an arbitrary formula phi, which is a CNF, conjunctive normal form. Let's take it negation. The negation is, uh, well, it's not formally a DNF, but you, I say DNF of the negation. If you have a CNF and you negate it, then translating the result into a, a DNF is easy because we just applied the Morgan rules and the uh, conjunction and disjunction get swapped. So this is a linear time algorithm. And this yields an equivalent DNF, just not even equity satisfiable, just equivalent. And now, if you know the number of satisfying assignments for not phi, how do you find out the number of satisfying assignments for phi? So satisfiability for not phi is not the same as satisfiability for phi because there could be examples where both are not or both are satisfiable, right? But if we have uh, the oh, what is called well here we have a g of n we say it right. So um, if we have the number, suppose we know so phi is a CNF. Not phi, well, virtually is a DNF. For not phi, we easily so suppose we know how to solve sharp DNF set in an easy way. So, uh, for suppose we know the number of satisfying assignments for not phi. Each satisfying assignment for not phi is a non satisfying, a falsifying assignment for phi, and vice versa. So, the number of uh, satisfying assignments for phi is uh, the complement of the number for not phi. The total number of assignments is 2 power k, where k is the number of variables, and we just subtract. And this is polynomially solvable if we rep represent our numbers in binary notation, right? And because just 2k two, two is just 1 and many zeros, and then we subtract by the standard algorithm. So what does this mean? This means that sharp CNF set is countably polynomial reducible to sharp DNF set just by duality, and therefore sharp DNF set is sharp P complete. Corollary, if P is not equal to NP, the sharp DNF set is not polynomial solvable. So DNF set is polynomial solvable as a decision problem, as a search problem, but not as a counting problem. So this is the difference. Counting can be much harder than, uh, than search or decision. Because if not, then we could solve also sharp CNF set, in polynomial time, and therefore we could solve the decision problem for CNF set, which is easier than the counting problem, and which implies that P equals NP by Cook Levin and Sage. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm missing. I'm also, uh, just sharp means one that you count of uh, number of satisfying assignments, or all of them, or is it called? Uh, the count. Sharp is the count. So you see that uh, we are trying to avoid yielding all the weaknesses, say, all the assignment. Because uh, in this case, we, we discussed it at one of the previous lectures, uh, that if we wish to yield all of them, our algorithm could be exponential, not because of the hardness of the core of the problem itself, but it could be hard uh, by uh, virtue of uh, just the size of the output. If you wish to, to, to yield all that, suppose you have just a tautology. 
tautology, any assignment is a satisfying one. This is easy, right? Uh, and uh, what does this mean? Then, then we, we, we wish to yield all of them. We just uh, take just exponential time just for writing them down. So uh, the other problems, they have compact answers. So if we have the uh, this decision problem, we just have zero or one. So it's just one bit. It's easy to write, but it will be very hard to, to guess it, to, under, to answer whether it is zero or one. Also, search problem. There we have to yield only one assignment, not all of them. Again, the as one assignment is a small object. It's not just a bit, but it's a small tuple of bits. Again, yielding such an assignment, just writing it down is easy, but uh, finding it is hard. And for counting problem also, we have to, to yield a natural number. And the natural number is from 0 to 1 to the power k. And it can be written in a binary, say, compact form, binary notation, which is also so. The, the number itself could be huge, but its notation is polynomial. And if you wish to yield all of them, well, we discussed this workarounds, what we called um, algorithm with polynomial delay. So the algorithm is exponential in whole, but the delays should be polynomial. This is the, the difference. Okay, so for counting problems, uh, the result is compact, but uh, it could be hard to find. Even for DNF, where the, so the bit 0 or 1 is easy to find, but the number of them is hard to find. And it's quite logical, because when you try to find the number of them, you don't have to look, you cannot just localize your problem to one clause, to find one clause. You have to look at all of them and see the interaction, all the complexity of these Boolean satisfiability problems come to, comes into play. Now let's uh, see how sharp peak completeness arises in a completely different area. Uh, so recall a well-known notion in linear algebra, it's called the determinant. So for a matrix, it's computed in the following strange way. You uh, try all the uh, permutations of our indices. And to find uh, and multiply this, so you, from first line you take say one element, from second one, and this uh, substitute this permutation means that from each there is a you choose n elements such that uh, in each row you choose one element, in each column you choose one element, and then you multiply them all, and multiply by a strange thing which is called the parity or the sign of the permutation, which is plus minus one, and this is the determinant. This is, a, I, I believe that all of you heard about that, it's a standard thing used in many, many things in linear algebra. And, uh, well, uh, here we see that uh, this is an exponential sum of exponential size, right? Because the number of uh, permutations of n elements is factorial of n, it's bigger than the exponential. But nevertheless, there exists fast algorithm for computing the determinant. Of course, not by this definition. But there is a Gauss diagonalization or something like that. So it's standard in linear algebra, algebraic algorithms for computing. And now, in the definition, as we recall, in the definition of determinant, the products are taken with different signs. So I think this is a matrix. And there are, uh, with a positive sign, we take one, two, three, these the diagonal, and these two triangles. So we, have, we can take this element, this element, and this element, all like that. So these are permutations which are called even, and the products are taken with sign plus one. And for this, we take minus one. So same, but it's dual, and we take minus one. And the permanent is like the determinant, but without signs. So we just take all these possible permutations and just take products, and then we multiply. Uh, permanents are also useful in linear algebra and its applications to data analysis. Uh, 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 so, despite they are not so popular as determinants. Uh, so, one example, well, uh, in Markov random fields, uh, there is so-called so normalization constant, uh, which is the, something used in randomization algorithms, and it's equivalent to computing the permanent. But however, computing the permanent uh, by definition as the determinant also requires more than exponential time, namely some n multiplied by n factorial. And unlike the determinant, probably there is no fast algorithm for the permanent. And this also follows from the theory of sharp p hardness. 
So let the matrix uh, have only zeros and ones. So this will be a particular case of the permanent problem. So if we can solve a general permanent problem, so the permanent problem in general, uh, even say talking about it as an algorithmic problem, could be something problematic because we need to talk about algorithms on, uh, uh, say, real numbers or something like that. And there will both how do we represent them, what is an algorithm, and stuff like stuff. Uh, here, uh, the permanent, uh, we, we just reduce it to the easier case when the matrix is just. Boolean. If we can solve this, in a, if we can solve the general problem, whatever it means in a fast way, we should also manage to solve this. But um, if we take it as zeros and ones, then the permanent problem can be seen as a counting problem. Namely, how many of the permutations give all ones in our matrix? So because in definition of permanent, here's the sum of products. So these are zeros and ones, and the product is conjunction, so it means that this is going to be just uh, one if and only if all of them are units, if at least one zero it comes to zero, and then we just have a sum of ones, which is just the number of what of these are ones. So it's a counting problem. For a given matrix, return its permanent if the matrix is Boolean. So... Um, the decision problem here, the permanent is greater than zero, is polynomial. Well, it's not uh, trivial, but we can say that it corresponds to find what is called a perfect matching in a bipartite graph. So uh, what is a bipartite graph we know? So we have two parts. Here, there, with these parts will be of the same size, n. And uh, uh, the graph is bipartite, so all the edges go from one part to another the other. So um, we say that uh, the corresponding element of the matrix Bij is one if and only if uh, vertex A is connected to vertex J by an edge. And the perfect matching is uh, finding a perfect matching in a bipartite graph is that you take uh, you take just mm, uh, you take uh, s some edges such that they cover each pair of vertices exactly once. It's like what we call the marriage problem, that if you have uh, s some male and female, and then you would say, okay, some of them are okay to marry, and then you say, when, when you can make all the perfect matching pairs, that each gets married to one from the other part. And uh, this is a well-known algorithmic question. It's polynomial or solvable which is called the whole theorem. It's uh, not, not a trivial result. In this installation of this course, we omitted its proof, but we could have solved sol it also. It's a standard polynomial algorithm of graphs, and it is the same as uh, computing that the permanent is greater than zero. Because this perfect matching exactly corresponds to all ones, right? It's, we have an enumeration of one side, we have a permutation on the other side, and this is a perfect match. So, Again, uh, this is like uh, for DNF set. Uh, the problem of finding at least one perfect matching is polynomially solvable. It's not trivial, but it's it could be done. And the problem of uh, finding the number of perfect matching, which is computed in the permanent, it's hard. And this is done in this paper by Valant. Uh, this problem is parsimoniously reducible to sharp two set, which is also sharp p hard. So, uh, what we knew, learned from uh, this uh, lecture that um, we have, I will return to the very beginning. So, beyond the NP class, we have also uh, search problems and counting problems, and. Uh, they could be harder than the corresponding decision problems. So for the search problem, we had this example, which I have to fix, but we had this. And for counting problems, our main example for which we proved everything was the example of DNF set. So DNF set was a problem which itself is as a decision problem. It's polynomial, it's a trivial algorithm, 
But its counting version is and sharp be hard, which means that it is harder than any other one, and therefore, unless p equal than p, it is not permanently solvable. And we talked a bit about other variants, which was a permanent problem as a counting problem for Boolean matrices, and uh, to to set, which is also one of these. The deep for the details, uh, we are referred to these two papers where we can. Um, uh, see the details of the reductions. This is not trivial, but you, you can you can look at. Okay, so this is basically the end of the uh, lecture course itself. And uh, in the remaining time, I would like to um, I would like to uh, recall what is uh, what was in our course for all the lectures, so we could have a small recap. Uh, so, mm, uh, we, uh, so this is overview. So we started with one of the most uh, classical uh, objects in discrete mathematics, which were called Boolean functions, or Boolean formulae. So a Boolean formula is, uh, we call it A of phi, so it's uh, something like, I don't know, B and uh, something like that. So it's uh, an, a formal expression, which is constructed from um, uh, propositional letters, as they call it, or Boolean variables. Um, Using standard Boolean operations, here you can see conjunction, implication, disjunction, negation. Uh, and uh, what was the idea of this is to um, understand the Boolean formula as a logical expression, as a logical statement, which um, represents some property of these elementary facts, like P, Q, R, and etc. And uh, in the Further situation, for example, uh, so uh, for example, we have a graph G, and uh, we asked whether it could be colored in the two colors. It means that for each Vertex, these are vertices, say V1, V2, etc. We could say that BI is means that VI is, say, black, otherwise it's white, and we wrote a formula which says that, which was a big conjunction of the fact that for each edge, so VI vj are an edge uh, we say that they should have different colors so there should at least one of them should be black and at least one of them should be not black which means white so this uh tuple of uh b1 b2 Bn uh, is basically the same as the coloring of G, the two coloring of G. And uh, this is a sort of called satisfying assignment. For this formula phi of phi G. So you see that um, this satisfiability problem for Boolean formulae, which means that there exists such a um, tuple of values of zeros and ones for our Boolean variables or propositional variables, it's an, a good encoding for uh, some other problems in finding some objects with given properties. So in many cases, when you ask for 
um, whether an object has, whether there exists an object or discrete object with given properties, then it can be reduced to uh, asking whether there is a satisfying assignment for a specific Boolean formula. And this informal statement is supported by Cook Levin theorem, which says that if the, the property of a very general kind, so the property is like that, that you ask whether there exists a Y such that R for a given X, so X given, and you ask whether there exists a Y such that R of X, Y equals one, and R should only be decidable in polynomial time, so it's just arbitrary property of X and Y, and the only thing we need that it is solvable in polynomial time, so effective algorithm, then uh, this is reducible, that this problem is reducible to satisfiability problem for Boolean form. So you see that this is a good um, example of how specific things become general. So we started from a quite a concrete and quite, by the way, boring example of, uh, say, discrete objects, just formulae and some zeros and ones which satisfied. There, there is something much more, say, fancy in discrete math, like you know, graphs, networks, some uh, other discrete objects, discrete geometry, for example. But it's all reducible to satisfiability, given the fact that it can be polynomially checked in, say, polynomial time. So it's a very vast, say, variety of all problems which is uh, possible to solve here. And um, it's reducible to satisfiability. Okay? So that the question of satisfiability is really important. And as I was told about that, so the, the, this is cook levin theorem. So satisfiability is a generic idea of to find something. There was also the um, uh, dual notion of uh, a tautologicity. So being a tautology means that something is generally true. And here there is a sort of a difference between people who are logicians and people who are, say, database engineers. Because for logicians, so it's dual, I will say that the dual is being a tautology. So to satisfiability is true. It means that the formula is true somewhere. Tautologicity means that the formula is true always. So for logicians, tautologicity is a uh, most, say, natural thing to, to talk about. Because being a tautology means that... Um, uh, something is a general logical fact. It's something which we regard as being, say, always valid, always true. This is tautologicity. Uh, satisfiability is not so interesting because, well, it's true somewhere, somewhere it's false, so it's something. For database engineering, for, say, knowledge bases, uh, satisfiability is uh, offers stuff like that, with finding something. Satisfiability is more important. Because tautology is tautology, something trivially valid everywhere. Satisfiability means we have to find out of our say, database, out of our world, some object which satisfies it. So it's, uh, it's not only about talking whether it is satisfiable, it's also about finding the satisfying assignment, which is um, a, mm, an object which we want to find, to, to satisfy the uh, specification, which we denoted here by R. So, but, but then you also, they're interrelatable, and um, actually we can talk about tautologicity, thinking about satisfiability. So for satisfiability, well, we uh, know that for SAT, there exists a resolution method. And again, this is a dual thing to proving, say, things in propositional uh, logic, because resolution uh, says whether you can uh, say that something is not satisfiable. You have a conjunctive normal form, you apply these resolution uh, transformations, and uh, in these transformations, we um, 
when we when we apply them, we um, I want to find the contradiction. So basically, if you remove everything else, then you have a phi, which is a conjunctive normal form, and you want to, if you can yield contradiction, then it's not set. And this is dual to saying that not phi is a tautology. So suppose we have not phi, and if we manage to yield to false, right? This is equivalent to not not phi, and this is equivalent to just to phi itself, right? So this is a tautology. So this means that falsifying phi, it making it false, not satisfiable, is the same as proving um, no, no, sorry, falsifying not phi is the same as proving phi, the classical logic. So if you want, if you have, so let me put it, okay. Uh, so if you have phi and you want to prove it, whether it is a tautology, you take not phi and prove that it is not satisfiable by resolution. So resolution is a negative way of proving. So usually if you talk about proof systems in general, you want to prove something positively that it's true. It's a tautology is generally valid and so on and so forth. Here we say, okay, no, I take it negation and I want to falsify it. It is the typical classical way of thinking. As I re recalled at one of the lectures, it's a bit of demagogical reasoning. Instead of proving positively that something is true, you falsify any its falsification. So you go for a debate and you say, OK, I will not prove that my, my formula is true. I will not prove that my, say, uh, political ideas are good. I will just ask you to try to, to negate them. And then when you prove your negation, I will falsify it. So why not? Uh, if, if you say that it's not true, I will falsify any of your argument. So classically, this gives you a proof of five. In non-classical logics, of course, this could not be the case because in, in real life, it's not a good way of proving things. But in this easy world of satisfying assignments of Boolean formulae with this distilled classical meaning of um, logical connectives, mainly of implication, you, you are fine. It's the normal way to do it. We had these uh, paradoxes of uh, material implication in our course and stuff like that. So we, have the, we know the limitations of this, but Cook Levin is a good thing um, which shows the power of classical logic. You can capture anything from the class NP. So recall that uh, problems like this, they belong to NP class. And this means that sad problem is NP hard uh, because any uh, NP problem is reduced to sad. Uh, but also it's called NP complete uh, uh, because sad itself belongs to NP. So you see that satisfiability problem, it, it is a non, a, a, a non deterministically polynomial on one side. On the other side, it's one of the <coughs> hardest problems of this, in this class because anything reduces to set. Next, uh, we know that there was uh, what were called Satan transformations. So by Satan, we know that satisfiability is reduced to its particular case, which is called three set. And therefore, this one is also NP complete. Well, it belongs to NP, of course, and therefore it's NP hard, it's NP complete. And then we had new reduction. So three set is reusable to many things like uh, three colorability. We did it on the previous practical class. It's reducible to Hamiltonian path. We did it in the previous lecture. It's reducible to, I don't know, click. Many problems, for example, on graphs. Our graphs were chosen just because they're sort of more visual. Uh, many of these problems, all of them are NP complete. So uh, the status of NP complete problems is that if P is not equal to NP, they are not solvable in polynomial time. And it's sort of approximation of being, in a sense, hard. That uh, a polynomial algorithm is regarded as being something like an easy, say, short way of solving problems. If we don't have a polynomial algorithm, we do not have a good way of solving them. 
This is a very, say, rough approximation uh, for in both directions. Because if you have a polynomial algorithm, but your, say, running time is bounded by, say, n power 10 or something like that, it's not practically usable. Because usually when you uh, take um, an algorithm which is, uh, uh, which is really applicable in practice, you wish it's complex to be something like n square, maybe maybe n cube, which is all, all, already something very hard. But if it's a 10th power, it's meaningless. On the other side, in exponential situations, sometimes it's possible to have some heuristics which make it fast working. And the sad problem here is one of the such examples. Uh, so there are pro pro programs called SAT solvers. And the set solvers are, are programs which wish to overcome P, P not equal to NP. So they are exponential in worst case time, but they are still quite fast and efficient in practice, which solves satisfiability problem. And then by Kuklevin, any other NP problem is reducible to satisfiability. And therefore, if we have a good set solver, we can use it for, say, finding Hamiltonian paths or something like that, which have many applications. For example, we've seen applications of Hamiltonian path search in genomics. So it's standard thing which we need to, to have here. So this is what we had about the theory of NP completeness. And uh, this is an approximation of what's going on. Unfortunately, this uh, P, whether P equals to NP or not equals to NP, this is a well-known open question, not, not known. And therefore, this mathematical theory behind this is quite strange. So usually mathematicians prove some uh, formal mathematical results about uh, some application area, and people use them, and they're happy. But here, unfortunately, all the results are based on an unproved conjecture that P is not equal to NP. I will cross it here that the question is whether it is equal, whether it's not equal. The main conjecture is not equal. And many things in this research are actually based on the hypothesis that they are not equal. But nevertheless, uh, it's not proved. We don't know whether it is true or false. So it's all conditional, re conditional reasoning. So, and finally, we also talked a bit about variations of the NP class, and we talked about this today, so I will not stop on this much. It's accounting problems, search problems, which can have different complexity from the basic PNP classes. Okay. So this finishes the lecture course. Is there any questions or comments? Then please ask. In the remaining five minutes, I will uh, talk a bit about the grading. So if no questions, I will uh, open the uh, course web page. So what happens here? Yep. So we have three home assignments. Uh, two of them, the deadline already passed, but uh, if you failed to do it, please email me. There could be a possibility to submit it later, but there will be a fine. There will be a reduction of the grade. So the third home assignment is due, well, today anywhere on Earth, so it means 3 p.m. Moscow time tomorrow. And uh, these the three and one are programming assignments. The second one is the midterm. Uh, the Final exam will be obligatory for all the attendants of the course, and um, it will be probably next week on Wednesday. So uh, this, this will be in your schedule. The exam will be take home uh, because some of the people are online and some of the people are uh, in the in class, so we'll make all in equal conditions. There, uh, it will be as follows. So in the morning you will receive. Uh, I will send it by email, also published on this web page. You will receive the um, uh, the tasks. The deadline will be set on the same day, same evening. So it will be uh, not not a week or something, it will just uh, the same day, like a written exam, and you have to submit it by email, just like home assignment number two. And uh, this is how it is, the total grade will be counted. So this is one half for home assignments and one half for the exam. So, um, uh, if you have half a grade, it will be 
put upward. So 7.5 is 8. Um, so these are the possible grades for homeworks. And prepare for your final exam. The final, you can you can ask what sort of problems could be there. Well, this is an example from the previous years on the web page. Six problems. Of course, it was not, not the same one, but something similar. And uh, that's it. So um, any questions can be asked by email. And um, thank you for your attention. Question? Like six, seven p.m. usually it was. Okay. So it's it's then basically it's whole working day. Like nine, nine. Uh, maybe even earlier. So formally, I think it will be nine thirty, like the beginning of first class. But I actually, I have a talk at a conference uh, in the morning. I think it will be nine a.m. So it will be for nine a.m. Probably something eight a.m. or something like that. And I will I will send you an email so you will you will, you will see it and also I will post the link on Teams. Yes, just just like homework too. So you can you can take a photo, you can scan, you can write it on a tablet, you can also write it in LaTeX, for example, if it's more convenient for you. Anyways, just, just it should be readable. It's it's checked manually, so I just have to have the opportunity to read. Yeah, and then also after that I. Probably I will check it the same evening. I will try to do it like that, or maybe the next morning. And the next day will be for you to. I will. I will give you feedback uh, for you to maybe ask some questions about grading. And, and so it's the the so the third the, the first day will be the exam. The next will be for checking and uh, finalization. And the third day will be for I will have to submit the results of the grading, or maybe the evening of the second day, but very late, something like at night. So. It's you will have one proper day for checking and uh, ask, asking questions. But please, for the results of the homeworks, I will put them, say, tomorrow. Please do it in advance, so not, not after the exam. There could be just stupid mistakes that I could uh, find out. So something was not graded properly. This could happen, so please be patient. It will be all fixed. Okay? Then, if no more questions, we start stop. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, demagogical. Yep, yeah, this is a question. Uh, you have said that proving unsatisfying the negation is demagogical. As I remember, uh, uh, why do we still use it? Well, this is a good question, and uh, the answer is as follows: that if we um, define our uh, Boolean logical operations as we do it. So, for example, mainly the implication. We define the implication A implies B as not A or B. Then, for such a definition of the Boolean tables for the um, uh, for the uh, logical operations, we have as a valid principle that not not A implies A, and this validates our demagogical way of reasoning. So, in Classical logic, this is the case. The uh, good part of classical logic is that we can use it for many things. And uh, one of the very good examples is Kuklevin theorem, that any NP problem can be implemented as a, a Boolean satisfiability thing, or current P problem as Boolean tautologicity. So we can use it really, and we can really use uh, variations of resolution method for set solving which is quite practical and the uh, the bad side is that when we uh, try to model our real say real world reasoning uh, like really logical reasoning this fails because uh, our say natural language meaning of implication does not coincide with what is called material implication which is the boolean one so and for that we have to use non-classical logics and for non-classical logics, we have non-classical reasoning. And there, unfortunately, this duality fails. So we don't have uh, the... Um, uh, so falsifying not phi is not the same as proving phi in non-classical logics in general. But in classical, this happens to be the case. And we may make fun of that, that satisfiability and uh, 
probability is dual, but it's a feature of classical logic. It's a limited thing. So this is the answer for Daria's question.